So our first speaker for today's exploration is going to be Sarah Moore. Um, she's a graduate student in neuroscience, and she'll talk to us about why uh, humans feel hunger and how, how animals or an animal can go half a year without um, feeling hungry. And our second speaker is Sarah Milholland, and she is actually recently graduated. So um, everyone should congratulate her on that achievement. And she's a graduate student, or I guess now a, uh, or was a graduate student in astronomy and will teach us about Planet Nine, which is a giant planet that may be in our very own solar system. So we have two subjects that are pretty popular amongst our um, students. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah, Sarah Moore. Okay, so hello and welcome. I am the first pair of two Sarahs today. Um, and today I'll be telling you about my work in the lab, and it's looking at how hunger works. And in particular, I work with a very special animal that can actually go over half a year without feeling hungry. And we're gonna talk about how that is so. Am I freezing? You guys look frozen to me. You look good. I'm good? Okay. Mm -hmm. So moving on. Everyone think about how you feel right now. Not emotionally, just are you full? Are you hungry? Did you have a big lunch? Do you have a small lunch? Let's see some things in the chat. So we know that um, the feeling of hunger is very innate. You can think about it immediately and know exactly how you feel. We know that we can feel hungry, ravenous, ready to eat a cake, or full. Another word for full being satiated, where even if we have a cake in front of us, we don't want to eat. So how do we feel hungry and how do we feel full? Uh, what organs in our body are involved in hunger? Can I see some responses in the chat? So I actually can't see the chat, but hopefully we get some good, <laughs> we got some good responses. Um, we have the brain, highly involved in hunger, the stomach, the small intestine, and these little egg-like things right here are uh, actually fat cells. So these four organs work together give us the perception of hunger or satiety or fullness. So let's think about how this works. How do we turn hunger on? So in the brain, we have a portion called the hypothalamus. This is kind of at the base of your brain here. The hypothalamus is very important for everyday um, act, action and activity. It releases hormones that are necessary for life as well as controlling our sleep-wake cycles or circadian rhythms. And it controls our homeostatic body temperature. So it makes sure that we stay at 98.7 degrees um, Celsius Fahrenheit uh, all day long. So within the hypothalamus, we have a group of neurons called the arcuate nucleus. A group of neurons are just called nucleus, and here this one's the arcuate nucleus. So you can think of the arcuate nucleus as the on-off switch for hunger. And in the stomach, we have a small little hormone called ghrelin. So ghrelin is responsible for making us feel hunger. And the way I remember this is ghrelin sounds like an angry, angry little goblin, some little gremlin that stays in your stomach. And then it actually travels through the bloodstream to bind to receptors in the arcuate nucleus. I'm just going to give you an analogy of how you can think about this. So think of a uh, plug plugging into a socket. Here, the blue plug is our hormone ghrelin. This plug is able to travel through the bloodstream to bind to receptors or the socket that's present in the arcuate nucleus. So when the one ghrelin binds to receptors in the arcuate nucleus, we plug in the plug into the socket and hunger is turned on. Okay, so then that's how hunger is turned on. How is it turned off? Surprisingly, we're, there's actually more methods of turning hunger off than turning hunger on that scientists understand. One of these methods um, includes or involves the vagus nerve, which is uh, a specific neuron in your body. And this nerve actually wraps around the stomach. And at the tips of each of these nerve fibers, there are little sensors. And these sensors sense pressure and change and stretch in your stomach. So after you eat a large meal, your stomach expands the vagus nerve senses the stretch and it sends a signal to the arcuate nucleus to turn hunger off. 
So that's one way we can turn hunger off. We also have different hormones uh, that are present in different parts of the body that can bind to receptors in the arcuate nucleus to turn hunger off again. These include PYY and CCK. So these are produced in your intestine after food actually reaches your stomach. And also leptin, which is a hormone produced in um, white, or yeah, uh, I was gonna say white adipose sites or fat cells. So these hormones, again, travel to the arcuate nucleus and they bind to receptors. They plug the plug into the socket to turn hunger off. So that's just a brief overview of how we can turn hunger on and turn hunger off in the human body. And in lab, I actually study a very special animal that can go up to seven months without feeling hungry. Does anyone have any ideas of what this animal is? Feel free to answer in the chat. So hopefully we're getting some good responses. And the type of animal that goes to seven months without feeling hungry is actually a hibernator. And specifically the hibernator that I study is a 13 line ground squirrel. So that's this guy here. So these guys are ground squirrels. They live underground areas of the United States, including Wisconsin. That's actually where we get our gerbils from. So you may be saying, well, they're hungry because they're sleeping. But that actually is not the case because hibernation is made up of a mixture of two different states. And by states, I mean animals appear to be sleeping or the scientific word we use is torpid for two weeks at a time. Uh, during this time period, their body temperature, heart rate, respiration rate, and everything drop to a lower level. But every two weeks, they wake up for 24 to 40 hours in what we call an interbout arousal. And during this time, animals are awake, they're running around, they're nesting, um, and they're just acting like normal active animals. So the question is, why aren't animals hungry during these interbout arousals or awake periods? So the first thing I did to try to answer this question is first, we need to understand how much animals will eat at different time periods across the year. If we give animals during uh, food during these IBA periods, will they eat it? So that's what I did. So I gave animals a amount of food and I weighed how much they ate. You can see these animals really like this experiment. And so here's my data. So just to orient you, on the x-axis here, we have days active where zero days is the first day that animals leave hibernation. So this is when they wake up in the springtime. On the right here, we have days in hibernation with day zero being the first day the animals enter hibernation. And below here, you can see a rough calendar estimate for when these things occur. On the Y axis, we have amount of food eaten in 24 hours. So what we can see is that the first day the animals leave hibernation in the spring to about two months in, they more than double the amount of food that they eat. That may not sound you know, like a very big increase, but just imagine if you went from eating 2000 calories a day to 4000, it's a very substantial increase. So when we get to hibernation, each of these points is an animal. And remember, I'm doing these experiments during IBA or the active periods of the animals. And what I found is that even more than three months into hibernation, uh, yeah, three months into hibernation, and if I give these animals as much food as they want to eat, they'll still eat nothing. Very, very little and definitely much less than they would eat during the active season. So it seems like these animals aren't hungry, which is really bizarre. Um, and the next thing I want to do in my project is to figure out why it is that these animals aren't hungry. So to do that, I went back to what we know about hunger in humans. And remember we have this hunger hormone ghrelin that lives in our stomach and travels through the blood to bind to receptors in the arcuate nucleus. So what do you think should happen if we give um, normal squirrels ghrelin? Should we see an increase in feeding or a decrease in feeding? I'm sure many of you guys are getting this right, but yeah, we should see an increase in feeding because ghrelin again is a hunger hormone. And you can see some data I have here. So I have active control, or these were animals that were not given ghrelin, versus active um, animals that were given ghrelin, <coughs> ghrelin. And you can see that there is more than a three times increase in the amount of food these animals eat. So ghrelin seems to work as it does in humans. But what about during hibernation? 
So I did the same thing. I gave animals ghrelin during a hibernation. Remember, these, this is their interbout arousal period or the active period during hibernation. And then we see no increase in food consumption compared to animals that were given a placebo. So it seems like squirrels are resistant to this hunger hormone, which is pretty incredible when they hibernate, but not when they're active. So why is this? What are the uh, bio biological mechanisms that are making it so that squirrels seem to be resistant to the effects of hunger hormones during hibernation? So there's a few different possibilities for why this may be. Remember the analogy of the plug plugging into the socket, where the plug is ghrelin and the socket is a receptor. It's possible that we have a reduction in the number of sockets during hibernation, such, such that there are fewer switches that are turned off turned on in the brain. Our option is that we have fewer plugs or less of ghrelin, such that we have, again, uh, less activation of the arcuate nucleus of the socket or a change in the shape of the receptor, such that ghrelin can no longer bind to receptors and therefore can't activate the arcuate nucleus. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually going through each of these options one by one, trying to determine which is the mechanism. So I have some data for you here, and we can actually exclude one option with this data. So on the left here, I have the concentration of ghrelin measured in the blood of squirrels. And here I have the concentration of ghrelin across different states. So this is active squirrels during the summertime. These are interbout arousal animals during hibernation. And these are the sleeping um, torpid animals during hibernation. And what you can see here is that there's very little difference in the amount of ghrelin that's present in the blood between um, active summer animals and hibernating animals. So it seems like option B is not the case. There is not less ghrelin during IBA that causes this inhibition of hunger. So I don't have the answer for you today. I'm still working on it, and hopefully I'll get to the bottom of this. But I hope you enjoyed the story so far. I just also wanted to mention one thing about squirrels. So, you know, sometimes my parents ask me, why are you going to grad school to study squirrels? And I've come up with some good answers, you know, to make them happy. And that is that these squirrels are amazing creatures that have incredible flexibility of metabolic function. Not only do they increase the amount of food they consume by double every, actually gain double or triple their body weight. So imagine if you doubled or triple your body weight. You could have no adverse effects, uh, no diabetes, um, and no inflammation. So these could be incredible models to study uh, to produce therapies for obesity in America. Squirrels, like I said, also hibernate. So they're able to reduce the amount of resources that they use. And there's actually interest in uh, sending squirrels to Mars, since these animals don't need as much energy to keep them warm. They don't need as much food. And maybe one day we can actually harness these um, mechanisms in ground squirrels, hibernating ground squirrels, to apply them to humans so that we can get humans to Mars. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really, really interesting. Um, I saw someone in the chat mention that like they knew squirrels were really cool based on um, Mark Rober's YouTube video. and kind of it became more evident now. Um, so uh, a couple of questions that we had in the chat is, um, I guess it was based on your last graph. Uh, what is the torpid that you had on that last graph? I'm not sure if everyone else is seeing this, but it looks like Sarah's a little bit frozen and lagging. Sarah, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't get your question. <laughs> uh, so on your last graph, like in the last couple of slides, you showed um, a graph where one of the bars was labeled torpid. So a question was like, what is torpid? Oh, so torpid is the state during hibernation where they appear to be asleep. So they're in this like sleep-like state for every, like for around two weeks, and then they'll wake up for around 24, 40 hours, and then they'll go back to sleep for another two weeks. Okay, I see. 
Um, so related to a kind of like hibernation, a question it, um, that we had is like, how do animals know when to hibernate? Um, and can we stop them from hibernating? That's a really great, great question. And uh, I've got to say that like the field of hibernation has been trying to answer this question for hundreds of years, and we actually don't know the answer. There are different types of hibernators. Some hibernators, uh, they're called facultative hibernators, don't need to enter hibernation. So they'll enter hibernation when there is, for example, a scarcity of food or water or environmental temperatures are super cold. Um, our ground squirrels are kind of special. They're called obligatory hibernators, meaning that they need to hibernate. So if you put these animals into a warm room, they'll still try to enter hibernation. So they'll drop their body temperature to room temperature, uh, blood uh, uh, pressure and respiration rate and heart rate will also decrease. Um, but as far as you know, why and how they know what time it is, um, we don't know. And they've even put these animals in like a 12-12 light dark cycle, meaning that they keep uh, constant light during the year. Uh, the idea being that maybe shortening days uh, like as I'm sure you've noticed during the winter time we have sh less light may be a cue but if we keep light constant these animals can still try to enter hibernation so it's a great question and we don't know the answer so kind of on an opposite of that like if an animal doesn't necessarily hibernate can you force it to do hibernate like kind of do the opposite of what you just mentioned yeah, so again, it kind of depends on the hibernator. Um, people have tried to force our ground squirrels to hibernate, and they will not. So people have tried to put them in cold rooms, they won't hibernate. People have tried to change the light-dark cycle, they won't hibernate. People have tried to remove their food, and they won't hibernate, if it's at the wrong season. Um, so there are other animals, like hamsters, uh, for example, and maybe you guys didn't know this, but some hamsters can actually hibernate. They're those facultative hibernators. So if they don't have food or water or it's very cold, they're actually enter torpor. So those animals you can force to go into hibernation, but these, uh, these special obligatory hibernators, uh, another example of an obligatory hibernator is a bear. You can't seem to force to enter hibernation. You mean like, so an obligatory hibernator is one that um, you can't force to hibernate? Like they'll just yeah. automatically go into hibernation? Yeah, so for whatever reason, we don't know how they know what time of year it is, oh, okay. but they know what time of year it is, and you can't change environmental factors to get them to hibernate at the inappropriate time. Cool. Um, so I guess with that, uh, we'll go into our breakout rooms and um, we'll have a chance to answer a couple more questions uh, through the volunteers. Uh, for those of you who ask questions that we haven't addressed, we'll get to them um, in a follow-up video at the end of the event. Hi everyone, it's really great to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Planet Nine, which is a, a hypothetical planet that is theorized to exist in the most distant parts of our own solar system. Um, but first, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about like my background and my path to science. So I'm going to start with that. Um, so I, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and um, I wasn't actually that interested in science as a kid. It took me a little while to get interested in science. And so when I applied to college, I was actually most interested in studying journalism. And I ended up going to this small liberal arts school in, in St. Paul, Minnesota called University of St. Thomas. Um, but when I got there, I kind of realized that I was more interested in, in math and, and physics, actually, than writing. And so I ended up double majoring in math and physics. Um, and then I started also getting interested in astronomy. And so I decided after college that I wanted to explore that more at Yale, where I um, studied astronomy and specifically extrasolar planets that are planets around stars other than our own sun. Um, and I just finished with my PhD this past May, um, and uh, it was a really great time there. So currently now I'm actually at Princeton University and I'm doing what's called a postdoctoral fellowship, which is kind of the stage between when you get your PhD and when you become a professor where you get more kind of experience and just uh, learn how to do more research. Um, so, 
So I'm really excited again to be here with you today. And I hope this kind of illustrates that um, you don't really have to fit, have it all figured out early on, that you can kind of figure things out along the way and you can come to science at any point you want or come to any field that you, you choose. Um, just explore what you're currently interested in and it'll figure your, it itself out eventually. Okay, so uh, planet nine. So this is a hypothetical planet that is theorized to exist in our own solar system, not, in, not around other solar systems, around other stars. And so in this talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe why there's some strong evidence for why we think that uh, this planet is in our solar system. And I'm going to talk about some of the work that people are doing to try to find it. Um, so first, I wanna go through a little bit of background information. So our solar system is composed of the sun and eight known planets, and these are pictured here. And uh, I've kind of blocked out some of these names here, and this works a lot better if we're all in person, um, but I thought it'd be kind of fun if you could help me fill in the gaps here. So um, starting from the first innermost planet here, can you guys, uh, if, you, if you want to write in the chat what this one is. Okay, so I see it, lots of Mercury, it's awesome. So that this is indeed Mercury. Um, so then we have Venus and then Earth, and then what's next? Mars, exactly. Um, next, Jupiter. Yep, okay, I see that coming up. And then Saturn, Uranus, and then finally, what's the last one? Neptune. Perfect, you guys are awesome. So, okay, so this, this diagram shows us the sizes of our beautiful planets to scale, but it doesn't show the separations between our planets to scale. So that's shown in, in this diagram here, um, where we have um, all of these planets are orbiting around our sun and the terrestrial or rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are a lot closer to the sun than the, the, the larger planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And so this diagram also shows another feature of our solar system. This is the asteroid belt, which is this, uh, this uh, bunch of small, like kind of rocky small objects that are in, a, in this area between Mars and Jupiter. And this diagram also shows Pluto that is uh, considered to be a minor planet, not, not like a full planet like the other systems or the other planets here. So this diagram though, doesn't show another feature of the solar system that's really important. And that is called the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt, is a disk of thousands of small kind of icy asteroid-like bodies that, that they hug kind of around the orbit of Neptune and they extend in a disk out beyond Neptune. And it's really similar to the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, except it's just a lot further out, so beyond Neptune, and um, it's a lot larger than the asteroid belt. So Pluto is considered to be a member of this Kuiper belt. There's a lot of other objects similar to Pluto. So the evidence for another planet in our solar system comes from some peculiar observations of that Kuiper belt. So in 2004, a really strange member of the Kuiper belt named Sedna was discovered. And unlike the other Kuiper belt objects that have um, orbits kind of very close to Neptune and very kind of circular, Sedna's orbit is really, really, really elongated and also just very, very far away. So even at its closest approach to the solar system, it's a uh, lot further from Neptune than these other ones. And on its di most distant approach, it gets really far away. And so when this, when this strange thing, Sedna, was discovered, um, it became kind of a mystery of, of how it got there, um, that it, this, this thing couldn't just have gotten onto this orbit all by itself, that there's some, there had to have been something that either pushed it or pulled it and made it go onto this really strange orbit. So since 2004, more and more of these really strange Kuiper Belt uh, asteroid-like bodies have been discovered. And uh, so this diagram is showing in red here is the orbit of Neptune. And then these, these lines are the orbits are of more of these Kuiper Belt objects that have been discovered that also have very elongated orbits. But we, there's also another kind of peculiar feature about these. And I was wondering if you guys, 
if you guys notice something weird about these. So just type into the chat, like what kind of looks, might look strange to you. So I'm seeing there so many overlapping, they're all ovals. Yeah, th th it's strange that they're ovals, but yeah. Okay, so now I see someone say they're all in one direction. And that is that is indeed what I'm kind of searching for here, that all of these things are kind of pointing in this general direction. Um, you can see if you draw arrows to the, to the sun to their closest points, then they all kind of point in this direction. And so, uh, this you could ask yourself well what's the chance of this being completely random that we just put down a bunch of these orbits and they all just happen to go to this side of the sky and the chance of that happening randomly is only about one in ten thousand so this means that it's highly unlikely that all of these things are just clustered over here just by random chance alone so this implies that there's something else in the solar system that we're not that we haven't known about before that is making them cluster to this side of the sky. And that influence is thought to be planet nine. So roughly about four and a half years ago in 2016, uh, two professors from Caltech, Constantine Batygin and Mike Brown, uh, published a paper called Evidence for a Distant Giant Planet in the Solar System, where they showed that if there was a really large distant planet in our solar system that we hadn't found yet, then it could make those those Kuiper belt objects cluster to one side of the sky like the way that we see them. So this was a pretty kind of dramatic uh, prediction when it first came out and it got a lot of media attention both at that point and in the years since. So here are just a couple of screenshots from the New York Times and the Washington Post um, the like shortly after this prediction was announced. So um, that paper, as I mentioned, was about four years ago. And since then, we found uh, even more of these really strange Kuiper belt objects. And um, you can see that um, although there are, there are more that point kind of in the other direction, so there are some that point exactly opposite that main cluster, there's still an over, like, uh, over density, or, uh, there's more over on this side, and it's still highly unlikely that we see that just by chance alone. So the kind of the dominant cluster of these things still remains. Okay, so even though planet nine is just a hypothesized planet so far, we haven't actually found it with the telescope yet. Um, there are some things that we know about it just by looking at how it's affecting these Kuiper belt asteroid-like bodies. So here are some nine things that we know about planet nine from uh, its, hypothesized, uh, its hypothesized parameters. So one thing is that it's really big or at least a lot bigger than earth. So it's thought to be about five to 10 times as massive as the earth. So here you can see a diagram with kind of the, the sizes of the other planets to scale and you can see that it'd be kind of similar, but a little bit smaller than Uranus and Neptune. Um, and its composition would likely be similar to Uranus and Neptune, which would be kind of a rocky and icy core with a large um, atmosphere of hydrogen and helium. Okay, another thing that we know about Planet Nine is that it's really, really far away. Um, so to, to help uh, give us a sense of scale, it's about 500 times further from the sun than we are from the sun. So it can be helpful to look at this with this little animation. Um, here are the, the terrestrial or the rocky planets. If we zoom out here, are the larger planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. If we zoom even further out, here are the orbits of some of those Kuiper belt objects. They're also called trans-Neptunian objects. And then here is kind of what uh, planet nine's orbit might look like. So you can see that it's like much, much further from the sun than we are. Another thing kind of as a consequence of it being so far out is that it takes really, really long time to make one trip around the sun. So it takes probably about 10,000 to 15,000 years just to take one trip around the sun, which is the equivalent of like our one year. Another thing we know is that it has a really eccentric or elongated orbit, kind of like those Kuiper belt objects uh, do. So uh, here's kind of another look at this, this planet and uh, this, these white 
uh, lines are the orbits of those Kuiper Belt objects. This is another look at those. Um, but this colored line is maybe what the orbit of Planet Nine would look like. So you can see that it's quite oval shaped and it's not like a, a, a perfect circle. Another thing we know about Planet Nine is that it's affecting these other objects in space. So kind of by the definition of, of us postulating its existence, uh, Planet Nine is kind of tugging on these other orbits and making them cluster to one side of the sky. So uh, it's, it's a really kind of dominant factor out in the very distant part of the solar system. Okay, so a sixth thing that we know about Planet Nine is that it have, may have been part of the inner solar system at one time. So like kind of right close to J Jupiter, Saturn in that area. So the, if Planet Nine does exist, um, one of the dominant theories for how it got there was that it used to be part of the inner solar system. So very close to um, the planets that we know about. And, but that at like a kind of an early and chaotic stage of the solar system's formation, it got too close to one of our giant planets and then kind of got slung shot out onto its far orbit, kind of like banished onto this distant stretches of the solar system. Um, so in that sense, if it is there, it really would be a, a true planet of our solar system just a lot further out. Okay, so the seventh thing we know about Planet Nine is that it could be the real ninth planet. So there's a lot of controversy about Pluto, um, but it's kind of ironic actually because Mike Brown, who is one of the main professors who, uh, per who proposed the existence of Planet Nine, was one of the primary people involved in demoting Pluto from being considered um, one of the planets. And so it's kind of only fair that he should have to like bring another planet back into the solar system um, and have a, a nine planets again. And there's really kind of no question about whether planet nine would be considered a planet because it's so much more massive than Pluto. It's about maybe about 5,000 times the mass of Pluto. Okay, so an eighth thing that we know is that Planet Nine is going to be really, really dim, like the, really difficult to find um, because it's just such a small, tiny uh, speck of light in the sky. But this is not deterring people from searching and the search for uh, to find it with the telescope is still ongoing. So uh, one of the primary telescopes that people are using to search for Planet Nine is, is the Subaru telescope which is on top of the Mauna Kea mountain in Hawaii. Um, this is the telescope dome, but the actual telescope is inside. And um, I think that might be a person there. So you can, there's a car. So this gives you kind of a sense of scale of how huge this is. Um, so this is one of the largest telescopes in the world. And this is really what we need to find something so dim. So there are a lot of the like dim kind of faint specks of light in the sky. So how are we going to know when we actually are looking at a faint speck of light that's planet nine? So there's kind of a cool demo that uh, that we can look at to to understand this in better. And it, it, it works if you if you take your finger and imagine that it's planet nine and look at something kind of across the room. So not your computer screen, but a little bit further away and then close your eyes uh, back and forth one by one. And notice how your finger kind of shifts with respect to things in the distance. So this is a this is an effect called parallax. And I'm wondering if you guys might have some ideas of how we could use this effect to hunt for planet nine, keeping in mind that planet nine will be a lot closer to us than some distant stars that we're looking at. So do you guys have any ideas of how we can use this effect uh, to, to search for planet nine? So someone says we could use it to check different sizes of, of space. So that's kind of, a, that's kind of like the idea that um, if we are looking at planet nine on two different points of our, of our orbit around the sun, so in, in January and in, Ju in July, uh, if, if we look at, at planet nine in January, um, it will look like it's kind of on this side with respect to these distant stars. 
But if we look at it in, in uh, excuse me, in July, it will look like it's on this side of the sky, with, so kind of on the left side. So the analogy with our finger is that planet nine, the, our finger or planet nine is kind of shifting back and forth with respect to the distant things, the stars, um, depending on when we look at it. Okay, so despite four years of searching though, using this technique, um, Planet 9 still hasn't been found with the telescope. And so this doesn't necessarily mean that it, that it doesn't exist um, because we already know that it's gonna be really difficult to find because it's so dim. Um, but there still is the possibility that it doesn't exist at all. And uh, despite all of the evidence for exi its existence, not all scientific theories are correct. And this is kind of a more general idea that I wanna highlight that uh, science is kind of a messy and clumsy process that it's not really a linear kind of straightforward question and theory experiment answer thing that we kind of often think of it as portrayed as, but that like we often kind of circle back on ourselves and we find something new and then we come up with ideas for why it might be, see what the community thinks and kind of go backwards and forwards and all of this is happening at the same time. It's a really messy, messy process. And so not all theories that we propose are correct. Um, so within this really messy process of circling back, um, some scientists have come up with competing ideas to explain these observations. Um, and one competing idea is that our knowledge of these things, these, these Kuiper Belt objects is just incomplete. That first of all, it's really challenging to find these ones in the sky. And it, because they are also very, very dim and just kind of small specks of light. And we can't, we can't look for them near where the, gal the Milky Way galaxy is kind of the densest because there's already too much like uh, other things in the way. And we can only also look at them at certain times of year. So basically, um, there's a lot of complications in finding these, these particular objects. And so um, some scientists have suggested that maybe it just our, our knowledge is incomplete and we've been biased to find things on this side when maybe the underlying distribution is a lot more uniform. So the kind of an analogy is, is if you have one light shining into a dark room and you think that that part of the room looks clean, but maybe the rest of the room is really me messy and, and we're not seeing the rest of the room. So it's kind of like maybe the ones that the objects that we're seeing have this pattern, but maybe the rest of them don't actually have that pattern at all. So this is just kind of one example of some disagreements that have been made back and forth about whether Planet Nine is really there. But for now, kind of the jury is still kind of out. And um, until we actually find it with the telescope or look through the whole sky and determine that we don't see it anywhere, then we won't really know for sure whether or not Planet Nine is actually there. But either way, if it's there or not, I think it will be really interesting because if it's not there, we'll learn something else about what's causing these um, Kuiper Belt objects to behave in such a strange way. But if it is there, then we'll have another member of our solar system that will help us learn how the overall solar system formed because we'll have to account for how this planet could have formed way out there when the, all the other ones are so much closer in. So um, I think that Planet Nine is still a really uh, cool thing to think about whether or not it's there. And I hopefully you guys think so too. And I really um, appreciate your attention and happy to answer some questions. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, we have a lot of really great questions for you. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them right now, but um, we'll get to the rest of them in the Q&A and then we'll send those out so that everybody can get all their questions answered. So I wanted to start with a few questions about Planet Nine. Um, does Planet Nine have another name? Like the other planets are called like Jupiter and Saturn? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so originally, um, so Constantine and Mike, the two professors who proposed it are kind of like funny guys and they want to call it George, but I don't know if that's going to be approved, but Planet Nine is kind of the name that we use because it would be considered the ninth planet in our solar system. Some people also call it Planet X for whatever reason, um, but right yeah, now- Yeah, a lot of people said that in the chat. Um, yeah. They suggested Planet X. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, um, 
just difference of opinion of whether it's planet nine or planet X. Great. Um, some more questions about planet nine. Um, some people have heard that it's similar to a black hole. Um, have you heard that before? Is that true? That is a really good question because actually there was like a paper that came out pretty recently that suggested that maybe planet nine was actually a black hole and not a real planet. Um, so right now it's really hard to test that idea because black holes are dark and we can't see them. Um, I think personally, like that's not very likely because we don't really know of black holes that are that small in mass. And um, it's just more, we, we're more likely inclined to think of it as a planet because that's more what we know was that forms around other planets rather than black holes. Awesome. Um, some questions about, um, do we know anything about if we could live on planet nine? Like, could you walk on it? Could you plant a tree? How far away is it? Could we get there? How far away is it in light years? Oh, wow. Those are all such good questions. Okay, so in terms of living on it, we don't really know yet. Well, first of all, it would be really, really cold. So we probably wouldn't survive because like we wouldn't, we would just like freeze to death. But also it's, it would, it, given its size of about five to 10 Earth masses, it would be pretty similar to Uranus and Neptune, which have like these really thick atmospheres that have no solid surface. So we kind of we wouldn't really be able to sit on it. But uh, some people have proposed that maybe Planet Nine has moons and maybe those moons could be habitable. So we don't, we don't really know, but that's a potential idea that, the, that it could have rocky moons. Um, as far as how far away it is, it's about like 500 times further from the sun than we are from the sun. So just kind of for a sense of scale, um, uh, Neptune is about 30 times further from the sun than we are. So it's like another about 10 times further from Neptune. So uh, it would take a really long time to get there, probably like uh, like hundreds of years with a with a um, like a spacecraft to try to get there. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, we'll have to answer the rest of the questions in the Q&A. Um, we're running a little bit short on time today. But thank you so much for the excellent talk. Um, I think we'll move into our closing activity now. Thanks, Kara. Thank you. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we had some great talks today from two wonderful Sarahs. We had our squirrel talk from Sarah number one, who I'll be asking questions to, and uh, talk about exoplanets and planets nine from planet Sarah, who will um, be going second. and. Rick will be asking her all of the questions. So to start off with, um, uh, Sarah, you talked about squirrels and trying to understand hibernation um, from this certain type of ground squirrel. So um, just kind of an overarching question of, you know, why do animals hibernate? Can you make them hibernate? Can you stop them from hibernating? I know you talked about it a little bit after your talk, but if you could just elaborate and remind us again, that would be great. Sure, so maybe I can kind of address this question by talking about which animals do hibernate. So the number of animals and the environment that they live in is actually incredibly diverse. So we have things like ground squirrels, um, hamsters, bears, um, marmots. So those are the main rodents. And we actually also have non-human primates. So there's some species of lemurs that live in Madagascar, and they actually can enter hibernation as well. So what these animals share in common is an environment where there are periods of severe scarcity, whether that's lack of food, lack of water, um, or extreme low temperatures. So in the case of ground squirrels, marmots, et cetera, it's cold temperatures. In the case of the non-hibernating or the hibernating non-human primates, the lemurs, they actually have very dry seasons in Madagascar. So that is the environmental pressure there. So that's what all these animals have in common. Um, in terms of how to make hi animals hibernate. Um, in terms of that, so there's, like I mentioned in the talk, two main types of hibernation, one that I'll call quote unquote tr true hibernation. And these animals will hibernate regardless of uh, resources or temperature or et cetera, which sounds kind of contradictory. But what has happened is that evolutionarily, their bodies have developed a physiology 
So all the pieces of their body work together to enter and leave hibernation. And this is so uh, hardwired in their physiology that if you give them different resources, they'll still enter hibernation. So those animals, you really can't uh, change their environment to make them hibernate. And it's kind of similar to stopping hibernation. There are some physical limitations, of course. So for example, if we have a squirrel that's hibernating um, at 40 degrees Celsius, when we move it to a warm room, it will wake up momentarily. So it will not be able to drop its body past room temperature because it can't super cool itself. Um, but it will try to drop its body temperature back to room temperature. So it'll, it'll go as far down as possible. So there are limitations on inducing and stopping hibernation for these quote unquote true hibernators. Um, okay, so one of the other great questions that came up in my chat room was this question about whether or not the fat cells that you were just talking about, they build up all these fat cells. Do those fat cells also send signals to the brain kind of like ghrelin and the stomach do? Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer is yes. These fat cells produce a hormone called leptin. It's what we call a satiety hormone or a hormone that makes you feel full. So the more fat cells you have, the more leptin your body produces, and the vice versa is true. So in theory, the more fat you have, the more full you should feel. And uh, it's a great question because it's actually one possibility that we're exploring in our squirrels. Um, right before squirrels enter hibernation, they have a lot of fat. And we're thinking maybe they have a lot of leptin, and therefore they have a lot of satiety. But the argument against that is that squirrels lose weight throughout hibernation. So actually, after five or seven months of hibernation, they're a very similar weight as to what they were at the very beginning of summer. So basically, they lose all the weight that they gain over the summer. So then you have less fat, less leptin, less satiety, or in other words, more hunger. So yeah, it's an interesting question, and, and we're actually looking into that for squirrels. Okay, and on this topic of like molecular communication between things in the body, if you were to either remove the part of the brain that receives like ghrelin signals, or if you were to completely get rid of ghrelin, what kind of effects would that have? Yeah, so um, people have tried to ablate or destroy the arcuate nucleus, which I said is the on off switch of hunger. And actually, the results that they get are kind of confusing because the arcuate nucleus has many different cell types. Um, so the, the net effect of um, destroying the arcuate nucleus is actually severe hunger. But if you want to be more targeted, if you take out the um, neurons that contain the receptors for ghrelin, uh, then you have an animal that is not hungry at all. And people have done this in mice actually genetically. Um, so this has been thought of actually for use as a therapy in humans, maybe you can create some sort of diet pill or a therapeutic um, that allows humans to feel less hungry. And people have actually already done this. And what they try to do is they um, introduce another molecule um, called an antagonist. And this molecule will bind to those ghrelin receptors to prevent ghrelin from activating the arcuate nucleus. And surprisingly, <laughs> successfully, it doesn't do anything. So this is pretty disappointing because people are really excited about this therapy. Um, and there, our explanation for it is that hunger is something that's innately, we need to eat to survive. So the brain and the body has what we call redundant systems or systems that work in parallel. So if you knock out one system, there will be other systems that can take up the slack and do the work. So that's um, one possibility for why blocking ghrelin in humans does not create a diet pill. Well, while we're on the topic of humans and everything, um, I guess the last set of questions has to do with, is it possible for us to make ourselves hibernate? Um, like, what are some of the things that prevent us from hibernating? And ultimately, you know, if we want to go to Mars, as you mentioned, like, what do you think we would actually have to do in order to do that? Is hibernation the key to help us? So that's the big question, right? Like if we want to study these squirrels, we want to relate them to humans. Um, so people have been looking at this for a while and it seems like human physiology or the way our bodies work has limitations that squirrel bodies don't have. So like I said, squirrels can drop their temperature from like 100 degrees Fahrenheit to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
people have tried to, or scientists, doctors have tried to induce hypothermia in humans. And the most we can really reduce human body temperature is just a few degrees um, before basically tissue will start to um, malfunction. Um, different salts will build up in tissues that will create dysfunction. And basically we can't cool humans that much. Um, the most humans can cool other humans is like a small hypothermia that's actually used in surgery. And this basically slows down metabolism. So open heart surgery is actually quite routine for doctors to chill their patients. Um, in terms of applying hibernation physiology or what we know from hibernation to humans, one place we'd actually want to look next is bears because bears are hibernators, but they can only drop their, they only drop their body temperature to a moderate degree. So instead of dropping from 100 degrees to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, bears drop from more like 100 degrees to around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And that may be within um, the limits of human, human bodies. So that's ultimately the goal, but we have a lot of work to do. And we've learned uh, through studying squirrels that it's really a whole body phenomenon and you can't just like change one part of the body and expect it to work like it, it would in a different animal. Wow, honestly, I would not want to be the researcher doing the research on bears. I like my arms attached to my body. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your questions. And I guess um, last thing, is there any other final thoughts that you want to mention to our listeners? Yeah, so one, uh, a few things that crossed my mind through reading some of your questions was, you know, how do animals survive this long without eating? And I actually just want to address that really quickly. And the, the answer is that not only do they have a lot of stored fat, but they also reduce the energy that their body uses. And this is actually why we want to use this technology in humans, for example, to get to Mars. Um, we want the, to be able to drop uh, heart, uh, like how fast your heart beats, how quickly you breathe, um, the metabolism of your cells. So basically we want to reduce the amount of energy that each of your cells burns uh, to reduce energy requirements. And all these things would basically allow us to give humans or whatever subject less food and allow them to survive for a longer period of time. So we basically want to apply these technologies in that way. Um, but that's gonna be quite complex and we still have a lot of work to go into. And hibernation is a really incredible phenomenon. And like in all my years of studying biology, I've really never interacted with any other animal that has such amazing flexibility um, in terms of like what its body can do. So if you're interested in hibernation, definitely Google some stuff up, uh, check out 13 mind ground squirrels. So yeah, thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sarah, and I'll pass it over to Rick. Awesome, thank you very much. So uh, the squirrels obviously were a big favorite. Everyone loves 13 mind ground squirrels. And even if they only had 12 lines, we would still love them just as much. Um, so we had mentioned so to transition us from squirrels and you know mars um tr traveling and by using the information we can get from hibernation um it doesn't seem like we might be able to apply that to planet nine traversal because it might be around 200 years it, it takes or so to get there but planet nine is still super interesting and we're interested in talking to uh, sarah milholland to figure out more about that because you all had a ton of questions that we're interested in, in getting some answers to um, so Sarah, how is it that we know that Planet Nine exists at all? Like, did this story originate as a legend or something like that? Or how are we talking about that right now? Yeah, so that's a great question. And there actually is some kind of truth in the legend idea because Neptune was discovered in 1846. And so ever since Neptune's discovery, people have wondered whether maybe there's another planet out beyond Neptune. But this is kind of the first real time that we have a very precise, well-defined hypothesis for another planet with well-defined properties that we think exist. And the reason that we think it exists is because we are observing how these small kind of icy asteroid-like things in the very distant parts of our solar system are behaving strangely. They're all kind of clustering to one side of the sky. And so uh, these astronomers have figured out that that may be a good a reason that why they're doing this, they're behaving so strangely, is because there's a big planet out there. And we know kind of what it would have to look like in order to, to produce the strange clustering that we see. I see. So as with all good scientists, I heard a lot of ifs and maybes and we think. Um, so if you only think that Planet Nine exists or might exist, then how do you know the size of it? Yeah, so 
So this is a great question. It kind of like gets at a bigger idea within science that we have hypotheses that we don't, we can't, we can't determine yet whether they are correct until we get further evidence that either supports it or refutes it. So we're looking for that further evidence by way of like observing Planet Nine with the telescope. But for now, um, we can kind of get an estimate on its size by looking at what the properties of those icy asteroid small things are doing. So they kind of cluster in one side of the sky, but they have, they're a little bit spread. They're not like a super, super tight cluster and they're not random either. And so the amount of clustering that we can see, we can kind of link to how big Planet Nine must be. If Planet Nine was huge, then the other things would just not be stable. They would not even exist. And if it was had no mass at all, then um, it wouldn't be causing them to cluster in the way that we see it. So there's kind of this happy medium where we can say this is about how big Planet Nine has to be in order to produce what we see among the objects so that we can actually see. I see. So since so many astronomers have studied the way that celestial bodies move in general, and you know how some planets, their size and how it influences others, you can sort of extrapolate that or make predictions based on those, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's all gravity. It's really cool, actually, that it's all the same force that's keeping us here on Earth. It's this um, gravity from the sun, gravity from the other planets, and they're all interacting. And it's pretty amazing, but this produces like these weird um, patterns like in these these Kuiper belt objects and so by understanding gravity we can understand um, like what we expect for planet nine awesome so it sounds like a really heavy concept I like it though um, so uh, since we know so much about what we expect planet nine to look like and we've been studying it for several years or uh, people have been trying to find it do you have any guesses of how many more years it might take for us to either find out whether we do think it does or does not exist? Yeah, and I think that's like kind of the million dollar question that everyone's wondering is like, how long should we expect to wait for this thing? And I think it, it's a really hard question to answer and I don't necessarily have the great idea, but if I were to guess, I would think that within about 10 or maybe 20 years, we should either know whether it is there, like whether we observe it or whether we can rule it out and um, we will have kind of refuted the hypothesis. But for now, it's just it's just really tough because we know that it's gonna be really faint, like a very faint speck of light in the sky, but we don't exactly know how faint. And because that would depend on the properties of the planet itself, like how reflective it is, how much sunlight it reflects off its surface. So even if we do search the whole sky, um, we won't have known whether we've got as dim of as we can go. Um, so that's why it's tough to answer, but probably like on a decadal time scale is something to think about. Okay, that makes sense. And just so I make sure I understand where you're getting that estimate from, is that sort of based on statistics of how long it will take to look at the sky and to get a good chance of seeing it and also advancements to technology? Is that what you're sort of thinking of? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm keeping in mind of um, like, so as in the next coming years, there will be some new astronomical surveys. So basically these telescopes that take um, pictures across the entire sky, and that will take, you know, a decade or so to complete. And so I think that will be kind of the, the next, um, like right now we're just using the telescopes that we have, but there's more coming soon that we will hopefully be kind of, um, definitive as whether it's there or not. I see. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed learning more about Planet Nine, and it sounds like we have one question from a student that just sort of wanted to know more about some of the planets we do know about our solar system. So do you happen to know what the fastest orbiting planet in our solar, solar system is, at least of the ones we know for sure exist? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good question, and this is actually a general kind of law that applies to all planetary systems that it's the closest one that's moving the fastest. Um, so Mercury is our, the closest planet to the sun, and it takes 88 days to do one trip. So for Earth, it's 365 days. In Mercury, it's 88. So that one's moving the fastest out of all the planets. Um, but it's sort of interesting that in other solar systems, there are planets that are orbit in less than a day. And so those ones are whipping around even faster. Um, so 
Mercury is kind of slow compared to other um, planets and other solar systems, but it's fastest in ours. Interesting. Cool. So not only is Mercury very hot, it is also very fast. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> cool. Uh, are there any other closing thoughts you had for students that you'd want to share with them? Um, I guess I just want to share that um, it's it's really interesting to think about our solar system as a whole. Like Earth is one planet out of eight or maybe nine in our solar system. And if we think about planet nine, we might be thinking about how did our whole solar system form and why did we get on this rocky habitable planet that gives us life and squirrels and, and all the rest. Um, so I think it's kind of cool to think a little bit broader um, about like how planets form and, and what's special about ours and what might be special about planets around other stars as well. So I think that's kind of, that's why I do my job and that's what I kind of would like to leave with everyone. Awesome, so sparking that curiosity for the next generation of scientists yeah. that wanna discover planet nine and 10, 11 and so on. Exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks a lot to both Sarahs. We really enjoyed both the planet discussion and the squirrels, and we'll catch everyone next time. Thanks.